On stage, they call it presence. Some actors have it, and some don't. Certainly, a good talker is also a good leader, an act of pacification that represents the most important event in the history of the source. Every department of life now showing symptoms of revolutionary change. I can here give only the general conclusions at which I have arrived, with a few facts and illustration, but which I hope in most cases will suffice. It will be difficult. So long as this conception is retained, the difficulty is not relieved by calling it an occasion. Homer did this for the Greeks, Virgil for the Augustan age, and Shakespeare for the English. The source heralds the benefits that accrue from unlocking the gates of reason and ignores the abominations. There are days when I find myself longing to be near a river or lake, <coughs> to let the familiar argument of analogy break down. This is not an ethical view of life. I've told at least one person everything I am aware of that I've done or that's been done to me. Thus, one emerges from the blind alleys and pitfalls of the source, tasting an orange, or touching a velvet cloth, or listening to Mozart. The orchestra was silent, the air was blue, there was a buzz of talk, it must have been about midnight. It is the hedonistic message of the lyric poets. Just watch me eat while you have a hunk of bread and butter or something. It is enough, after all, to transcribe the muffled sounds of the town reaching through the window slit, but most of us, when listening, visualize characters and customs in terms of our own life, and I have accordingly turned bonnets into hats, a morning dress into a housecoat, an evening tea into supper, when it seemed necessary to the continuity of listening. The tongue tastes the flavor of soup, with the same speed with which the source demands one to continue eating. There are always different schools of skeptics, philosophers doubtful of the possibility of effective knowledge in this or that matter. And their existence is perhaps the surest sign of the heat and sophistication of the source. Its ability not only to know such things as are human, but also to, know, to foreknow things that are post-human and thus the holy fruit matures. Just as soldiers find fragmentation minds useful to set up around a bivouac at night, so we too, when considering the source, mix ideal with empirical, empirical with ideal, over-investing in such impermanent perimeters. The remains will not be identified using dental records. There are other methods for suppressing dissent. The source is respectful of tradition, yet grounded in the insertion that it speaks many vows with many voices, turning an actual image into an illusory one by thinking to assist the sun in performing its daily journey across the sky. When the source is formed and expressed in words, writing, it is true, has shaped it, but the spirit of the source the creative urge it represents, the feeling it expresses and evokes, and even in large part its subject matter, come from only two words, is and are. Thus, our solar system spirals into a higher orbital frequency, and there is no more of the babble we've loved and counted among our blessings. It is after you have realized that there is a real table and an object upon the table, and that you have broken that table and whatever it displayed. It is only after this, and not a moment sooner, that the source begins to speak. It isn't concerned with the means of achieving certain specified ends, but with the ends themselves, reduced by an apparent lack of autonomy, of rational clarity and mathematical elegance, whose derivation from impressions of sense cannot be explained or demonstrated, it finds a reasonable explanation in the concept of itself. Suppose a man left his office at noon and were questioned about it. 
Suppose the assembling of an alarm clock wasn't an advanced mechanical technique for a four-year-old. Suppose we see points in straight lines, numbers and logical necessities, in the same way we see rocks and trees. Suppose the source's cultural importance really has gone unperceived. Suppose these are qualities we consciously or unconsciously associate with money. The source consists of such propositions. Such propositions consists of words. Words are notions of symbols. I know only bodily things, but knowledge has no container. This, however, is wrong. One can bring to mind the scent of sea air, or the sound a boot makes crunching in snow. This marked alteration of intellectual environment subjects the doctrine of the source to a test of its subjectivity, inland, midsummer, barefoot. But enough of this filth. The source puts up with you, puts up with you, laughs at you, and teases you unmercifully throughout life. The stories that sink into your consciousness as a child will hardly be more vivid than the fact of your death. All footprints point toward it, but none come away. Making contact with the earth itself, indulging in orgies of violence and persecution, openly revealing yourself as an enemy, or developing a new ethical theory fully in the public domain. One endures orders as one does punishment. All education is training and obedience, a tiny frontage on the factory of the source. What great queen would exile herself in masculine courage, chatting quietly as the actors and crew go about their work? In the end, character always wins. Some years ago, I wrote a book called Novel Pictorial Noise, in which I endeavored to some extent to describe snow drifting in too small a space for the operation of the divine, and to tabulate as far as I could images streaked with rain or dew, giving instances that had been observed in the course of my investigations in connection with the source. For the moment, I shall try to put the matter before you from another point of view, and those who wish may supplement the information by reading that book as well. What a piece of powerful machinery is to the hand that operates it, such will the perception of the idea of physical and ethereal space be to the thought which generates its form. Let me put it baldly. A new deal of the old cards reopens the polemic on its back in schoolyard gravel being pounded to a bloody pulp. Nevertheless, it's destined to do great things. Can a creative impulse bring you closer to intoxication? I once heard someone say that people write poetry to find a child carrying one of her mother's sewing needles and playing a soundless piano. Let me begin again and appeal to you in the name of a small bird, a roach, a flower even, which might fairly say that the world is not its friend, but a symbolic arena for social competition, one openly brutal or completely indifferent. Either way, the chief advantage of being human somehow makes it from one side of the wall to the other. And then I'm just going to read a few short, newer poems. The problem. A woman accidentally walks into the men's room. A man deliberately walks into the women's room. I don't believe in dialectics, but abide by them nonetheless. It is like a painting of someone sheathing a sword. The problem is, it is also like a painting of someone unsheathing a sword. The problem. He starts with 16 apples. She starts with 64 apples. If he gives her two of his apples for every eight that she has, how many, wait. <laughs> Math is for some a beautiful art, 
Within the movement and manipulation of digits, they see an enormous mass of sunlight assemble itself into an exceedingly clear day. The problem is, I just see apples, thousands of them. <laughs> the problem. He learns that a distant relative bred singing crickets in China. Funny, distance is always relative. For example, those telephone wires, those ones there, are both 15 feet away and nearly five miles from here. And here's something else. Of the four distinct cricket songs, my favorite is the copulatory one. The problem isn't putting things together. That's easy enough. The problem is prying them apart. The problem. She suddenly remembers having long ago gotten rid of those terrible books by the author she's reluctantly putting up next week, and so spends the afternoon going from bookstore to bookstore in the hopes of replenishing the shelves he's sure to scour, eventually buying back the very copies he'd inscribed to her so many years ago, and thusly avoiding the problem altogether. <laughs> the problem. She writes a stunningly accurate review praising the reclusive novelist's long-awaited new book. Upon its publication, a key sentence of the review contains an <coughs> error of omission that, while minor, reverses her intended meaning, rendering the piece as a damning take on the book. Still, there is near universal agreement as to her review's stunning accuracy. The problem is, as any good narrator knows, accuracy is never stunning. Thank you very much. <laughs>